so this research was done uh, together with uh, Rona Epstein and Geraldine Brown, and I think they might be uh, listening to us today. So hello to both of them. And uh, as I was saying, we in midwifery we talk about vulnerable women. But one thing we have to ask ourselves is who, who actually makes them vulnerable. And just to give you a few more facts uh, from the ones that uh, Janie and Sue have mentioned earlier, around 600 women a year enter um, prison in the UK, and about 50 of them are pregnant at one time. Uh, they are five times more likely to have a stillbirth, five times more likely, and twice as likely to have a premature birth with all the consequences and the challenges that that uh, brings. So basically, with all these figures and uh, following the report from Bronzefield's um, prison in Surrey in 2019, that a woman was left to give birth alone in her cell, and the baby was uh, died or was a stillbirth, I'm not sure. Uh, and with the starting point that prison is not a safe place uh, to be pregnant, we have started this research to find an answer to why are pregnant women in prison. So how we did it. So this research was funded by the Oakdale Trust and uh, with help from birth companions and women in prison, we designed an online survey. We had 19 participants. And we also explore three case studies that they were uh, available to us. So what we found, actually what we found is all the things that Susie has already told us in um, her story. And basically all these findings, they reflect the structural failures of a system that is not working and how inequalities shape and disadvantage the lives of some women and, and those of their families and babies and, and, and really um, for no reason because there is no need for them to be there. So the offenses, all but two were nonviolent. Uh, the most common reason for being in prison was recall on license. Uh, and the stages of pregnancy when women were sent to prison, they were quite advanced. Like six of them were sent to prison at 28 weeks or later, and three were already 36 weeks pregnant. When they enter, we had two women who entered prison in their um, final trimester pregnancy. Um, half of them suffered a history of uh, mental ill health. Uh, one third had drug misuse issues. Three had been homeless and four were victims of domestic abuse and coercion. So this already tells you that, you know, that system that is not working had failed them well uh, before they enter uh, the prison. And from their experiences of pregnancy and birth in prison, they, they, they showed, uh, their story showed stress and anxiety, lack of support, loneliness and difficulties in accessing services as uh, Susie has also uh, told us. So we all know being midwives that we need healthy mothers and healthy babies to have healthy communities. And this is something that uh, pregnant women in prison cannot achieve. Uh, so the lack of support was uh, reflected through some of the quotes that um, the participant gave us. And this really talks about uh, bonding and the impact that being in prison and this lack of support was having on their mental health. And we all know how important it is to keep a mother and a baby together. And also we know about the consequences of uh, separating them. And this is something that is not available. We all know that uh, also it's a postcode uh, lottery across the country. So not every woman can be placed in a mother and baby unit and keep their babies. So I'm not gonna read all the quotes because you will have access to these materials later. But for those of you who are just listening, I'm just going to mention what Owen said, said, I had nobody. So from the start, I was set to fail. Or Ursula, who said, I feel constantly worried about my safety and if I would be released before the birth. Petrified, he would be taken from me. So some of these babies, they're actually taken away and given for adoption, like it was the case with uh, Owen or um, 
sometimes they're put in foster care. And uh, as Mandy was saying here, I just don't understand why they have done this to me. I feel I was punished for being pregnant. Now they have taken my son, which I can only get to see twice a week on a video call. It's not good enough. So they talks about bonding and, 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 you know, and the impact this has on the relationship, not only uh, the relationship between the mother and the baby, but also like future healthy relationships um, in the family unit. Another issue was the access to services. And this not only talks about inequalities, but this talks about a lack of uh, health equity. So this, again, going on uh, what Jenny was saying before about the uh, statements that the RCM and the Royal College of uh, Obstetrician and Gynecologists have said about women in prison should have the same uh, access uh, to midwifery services and et cetera, et cetera. That's not the case and it will never be. Women in prison will never, never, never have the same uh, care that the woman in the community. And that's something that needs to stop. So women told us about missing appointments because uh, of staff shortages in the prison. They told us about uh, the treatment they received both in the prison and in the hospital, lack the dignity and respect. And I think this talks to uh, a lot. This quote from Jody. She says, I was ignored and not believed that I was in labor. I was not responded to when I rang my cell bell. And when eventually answered, I was spoken to through the hatch. I was asked to prove my labor by showing the nurse at the hatch a sanitary pad with the mucous membrane. It was at that moment I felt a loss of dignity. I was left from Saturday night to Monday morning in labor alone in my cell. When a staff arrived on Monday morning, I was taken to the hospital. The whole experience was traumatizing. It is barbaric that this society would send and keep pregnant women in prison. And this is not new, and we have heard it from Susie, we had heard it from previous uh, uh, research. This has been happening for so long that now it needs to stop. Also, I have to say that some women uh, mentioned uh, the care they received from the midwives and the support they were getting from them. But as Susie was saying, midwives are not there seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and they have set days to come to prison. So it's not always easy. And then they also appreciated the support they were getting from um, organizations like Birth Companions and Holy Says. Birth Companions were there every step of the way, gave me so much love and support. And it's about that, feeling the support and the love and being able to access what you need. So, what is it that we are asking for? What are the alternatives? So we need to start from, from the, the starting position that no pregnant woman should be in prison. And we already know that there are many countries that don't permit the imprisonment of pregnant women. So it is possible and it can be done. So there are community support facilities that they are non-punitive residential options like these ones in the pictures, uh, the one at the top is uh, the Phoenix Futures in Sheffield, and the one at the bottom is uh, the Jasmine Mother's Recovery in Plymouth. So we are asking for the government who are currently thinking about building 500 new prison places and spending a lot of money on that, to use some of that money to increase funding for women's centers and to establish a network of non-punitive, supportive, sustainable, and caring residential facilities. But overall, and I think we as midwives, we have a voice here and we can advocate. And we, at the end of the day, we are advocates of human rights and women's rights. So we need to move to a model of care that is fair, respectful, and safe for all. So if you haven't done it yet, go to Jenny's campaign at uh, We Level Up and uh, sign it. And also talk with your colleagues and with people because uh, this is not something, this is not a topic, or this is not a group of women we normally talk about. So thank you so much. <laughs>